This is my mom. And this is the bookcase I just built for her. See, I'm, walking on, I'm so excited I'm walking on the floor with shoes on. Clearly, she has no idea that I narrowly avoided disaster on this one. Oh, I got a good one for you today, friends. This one's gonna be fun. Now, there's a tremendous amount of work to do in a very limited time frame, so the first thing I need to do is start picking through the lumber that I have set aside for this project, which is, by the way, just gorgeous. I'm gonna pick through it, I'm gonna start resawing it so I can let it settle for a couple of days and let any tension kind of settle out of that material so that we can get busy. So I'm gonna stop rambling, let's go. These have been sitting for a couple of days now. They've been resting after I resawed them. Yes, there's gonna be some worry about these moving a little bit. They have certainly bowed a tiny bit over the length, but this is gonna be a big carcass. This is going to be cabinetry as it were. So a little bit of a bow over eight and a half feet, that's gonna come out in the wash. Once I get all of the dividers in there, do the joinery, glue the thing together, it's not going to be the end of the world. So while it's less than ideal, it is workable. So at this point, what I need to do is I need to get these things milled, jointed, book matched. That's the goal. So I'm gonna stop talking and get to it. Let's get busy. All right, so here is the situation that I am in. All of the boards are milled up and book matched and glued together, but as you could probably tell, they're not exactly flat. Oh my God. No, God! They are bowing along their length. And part of the reason, most of the reason, is because of the natural tension in the wood. As soon as you split those, you take a board, you split it, and it does one of those, bananas. And then when you book match it, you're just accentuating the banana, right? You don't have the ability to counteract it by doing uh, some other kind of glue up. It's less than ideal, but this cabinet is going to be 100 inches long. It's gonna be long enough, or it should be long enough, that I can flex those curved pieces down. Right, so if the cup or the bow is running this way, then I can put the corners down and it will keep those center uprights clamped in place. That is the theory. Now theory is imperfect. Is it likely okay? Yes. Is it less than ideal? Obviously. This is the situation I'm in. This is the material I have to work with. And so we're gonna make it work as best we can. And this is a good moment to acknowledge that even after a decade plus of experience, you don't always know how something's gonna turn out. You can't really predict it. This is a less than ideal circumstance in which to work, but we gonna do it anyway. So the plan now is I need to mill these to final dimensions or just oversized to final dimensions. That way I can start my joinery. So let's go ahead and do that.
So, now that all of our milling is done, it's time to start doing our joinery. The joint that I'm going to use in this piece is a very simple variation on a housed mortise and tenon. It is a dado and a positive, and then I have these two floating tenons in here, probably be three or four in the case itself because this piece is only six inches wide and the case is 12. What I'm gonna do in order to make this as efficient as possible is I'm going to use this jig that I just made up. Now, I've already done an entire video on that. You can click the link in the corner if you wanna go watch that, but very, very briefly, all this is is a very traditional dado jig where a fence is at 90 degrees and I can ride my guide bushing or my router against the fence. This fence just pops on here and I know that this fence is exactly the distance from the center of my bit for this router so I can make my dado however big I want. And then without moving anything at all, I can put this spacer in place and I can use this to plunge my dominoes directly in the center of my dado. So now that everything is cut to size, I should be able to just go through, mark the center of my dados on all the locations and just rip through them in no time. Now, before we dive into cutting all of our joinery for our real components, I do just wanna say, you saw me cut this dado in my actual workpiece. My front and back dominoes are the smallest size. They are exactly the size of the domino. The two middle ones are the second setting, the in-between, so they're a little wider, a little bit more play there, just in case something is misaligned. I've cut the positive part for it. I've just routed the tenon on here, and you'll see me do that in a second, but what I wanna bring up before I get busy is just the fact that keeping your off cuts is really, really important for making sure that your setup is done properly. The first time I did it, you can see I did the same thing. I routed my tenon and then my dominoes offset. You can see that my dominoes are not centered in my tenon. And guess what that means? That means that this didn't fit. So I reset my domino and now they're centered in the tenon. And I can go in here Tight. Having your off cuts remain so that you can use them because they are milled to the same dimensions as your actual workpiece, critical to be able to set up a machine properly. Now that all being said, let's do our actual joinery. So with the main carcass joinery done, all of my housed floating mortise and tenons are set, everything looks good, everything's nice and tight, and the theory, the hope that I had that this would flatten out once the joinery was done, absolutely true. Everything looks good, it's sitting on a flat plinth, and the top looks fantastic. So I'm not worried about that, and it's gonna be held even tighter in place once I get my kind of shelf dividers glued up in there. So on the rest of the joinery, the main structural joinery components are done. That's what those housed mortise and tenons are doing. For the shelves, there's no real reason for me to add additional dominoes or tenons. I could, there's nothing wrong with it. You're only going to add strength, but it's also going to make the glue up a little bit more difficult, a little bit more time consuming. And gluing this thing up is already going to be kind of an issue because I don't have the ability to slide anything in from the back. So this is gonna be the front, this is gonna be facing the living room, there's gonna be a staircase right here, and this is all going to be exposed. So I'm gonna have to glue everything up kind of traditionally, right? Traditionally, that's not the right way to phrase it, but you know what I mean, it's gonna have to be sandwiched in place rather than being able to glue up the carcass and then slide things in from the back as I would for say a wall hanging cabinet. All of those factors being part of this situation. I think what I'm gonna do is just cut dados for the shelves, cut dados for the verticals. I can use the exact same jig that I did for the housed mortise and tenons and just not put the tenons in there. Are you sure about that? But the rest of the process is gonna be identical. So I think that's what I'm gonna set about doing today. Oh, Jesus. I wasn't expecting you guys to just pop in on me like that, but Okay, well, now that you're here, a quick note from the editing room. I am 
very confident in this section about my not using any tenons to make these shelves fit. And that was the plan. And the theory works, right? Having shorter tenons only being about eighth of an inch long makes the assembly easier because it doesn't take much room to be able to move those into the joint to seat those home. But what I figured out during subsequent dry fits is having the extra length of a floating tenon actually did make things easier because I could kind of get the joint halfway home, rest them on the tenons, and then as I got everything into place and then clamped it and drove it home finally, then they seated all the way. So I realized after I filmed this that I did in fact want to put tenons in there. So as soon as we cut to the next scene and you see those floating tenons in there, don't be confused or misled. It was just a thing I figured out in the moment that was going to make life easier. So I went ahead and did it. And that is what happens sometimes. So. Let's get back to it. Now, a brief note on design before I get busy with the shelves. I could very easily leave everything flush on both sides of the cabinet, have the dividers and the shelves come flush to the front of the carcass, and indeed, that's what I plan on doing on the back side of this piece, on the staircase side. But on the front side, on the living room side, where you're more likely to engage with this piece and actually take things on and off the shelf, I think it's important to have some kind of depth there to just elevate it ever so slightly. And so the plan at this moment is to take these dividers, these two interiors, and set them back a quarter of an inch from the front of the carcass. And then I'm gonna take the shelves and set them back another quarter inch from the dividers, and I think that will give just enough depth where it's clear that it was intentional that this thing should be an object rather than just a big piece of casework. We'll see if that plays out the way that I hope it will, but that's the thought at the moment, and the reason I bring that up right now is because that is going to affect how I lay out and cut my joinery for the next few pieces. So I'm actually gonna take my shelves down by a half inch to their final width and then I'm going to cut all of my joinery from the back side of this carcass where everything is flush so everything lines up nice and evenly. Now let's go do that. been a couple of weeks, two and a half weeks since I've worked on this, so it's time to get back into it. But before I actually get to building, we do need to talk about what I did over here, because I goofed it. So essentially, I was working on this shelf right here, cutting the dados and the dominoes for that, and I failed to reset the depth of cut from the positive portion of the shelf to the negative portion of the shelf. And consequently, what ended up happening is I blew through this. Now, this wouldn't be the end of the world if it was the opposite side, because the opposite side is going up against a wall, and so I could have patched it and nobody would have ever seen it because it's gonna be installed permanently. However, this of course, of course, is the show face. So you have a living room over here, and then you wrap around and you come down a staircase on this side, meaning that if there is any one face besides the top that people are going to see the most, it's this face. So. I tried to plug it. Of course you can't plug it and make it look good because you're cutting across the grain. There's no real way to kind of blend that in without having that dark glue line around there. So ultimately what I decided is I'm gonna do some decorative elements here. So we're gonna call this a design opportunity. I've got two shelves coming across this face. I've got three tenons that are going in there. They're floating, they're, they're stopped tenons, but there are three tenons in there and so, I think we're gonna use the opportunity to accentuate those with essentially a plug. Think kind of green and green style furniture where they had those square ebony plugs in there to hide screws. I'm not 100% sure how it will affect the overall tone of the piece. So that's one of the explorations we're gonna to have to do here. We're gonna to have to see if it works. I don't know, but I think, I think it will be just fine. And so what I've done is I've milled up a piece of zircote that is the size of the mid slot for the domino and uh, we're just gonna punch six holes 
and then we're gonna fill them with these, round them over a little bit, make them look pretty, and, and give some kind of tactile finish to it. And uh, that's how we're gonna solve this issue, because there's not really another way to do that short of veneering this entire surface. So at this point, what needs to happen is I need to dismantle the entire thing and I need to start doing surface prep and edge prep, or uh, uh, edge profiling, if you will. And really what's gonna happen is the main carcass is gonna stay flat and square, it's just gonna get cleaned up, and then the internal components are just gonna have a very soft pillow on the edges, just to give it some visual interest and not to keep things so square. It's gonna have just a little bit of a softer edge so that it feels nice and interesting to touch. So that's the aim, and then the ears up top will get shaped just a little bit uh, to give them some visual interest and a little bit of line leaning in and out of this piece. So that's what's gonna happen, and then it's just gonna be a metric butt ton of sanding. And so we come to the glue up. Everything's sanded, all of the edge profiles are done, all of the shaping is done, and it's looking good. It's looking like a nice object. It is just on the other side of the camera, and I'm very happy with the overall form of uh, what's going on here. But this glue up is not gonna be easy. This glue up is going to be broken down into three stages. And so I think before I actually attack the glue up and walk you through that, I think we should take a look at the object and talk about what each structure, what each component is doing for the rigidity of the piece and uh, then break down why that necessitates the approach I'm about to take. So let's do that. So here's the situation. This is looking good, it's feeling good. All of these components are fitting together nicely, which of course is the most important thing. But this glue up, it's gonna be a pain in the butt because specifically these pieces, these dividers right here are locked in place. Like in a normal circumstance, under normal building conditions where this is gonna have a back on it, you can slide those pieces in through a simple dado and you can do the main carcass glue up in one section and then put the dividers in after. But you can't do that with this because these dividers are doing two very, very important things. Number one, they're preventing the shelves from sagging. So this one's gonna be under tension to keep this shelf from sagging over the years. And then this one underneath here is going to be in compression, keeping this shelf from compressing over time. And as you know and you've seen over this build, None of these pieces are straight. No, God, please, no, no! And so secondarily, what these things are doing is actually keeping them straight by gluing them in place, allowing for expansion and contraction, but making sure that they're not cupped in one direction or the other. And that's key for a bookshelf, not only aesthetically, but functionally. Now what that means from a tactical perspective, if you will, is this center bay needs to get glued up first and individually. And I'm not going to glue the top component on just yet. I'm gonna leave that off, but all of these components are going to get glued up. And then I'm going to glue up the outside bay, whichever one first, and then I'll glue up the other outside bay over there to kind of cap the thing off. What that's going to allow me to do is make sure that each piece is exactly where I want it and need it without having to rush through the entire glue up. And that's key. So another thing to consider is what adhesive am I using for this glue up? Now there's a number of different ways we can approach this as far as the adhesive of choice. You can use a tight bond one, tight bond three. Your work times are minimal, so you're gonna have to work quickly. And I mean at a pace. You can go like the tight bond extend route, which I believe has an open time somewhere in the range of like 20 minutes, which is nice. It could be a little bit longer than that. But if I'm going to go down that route, I'm usually either going to use epoxy or old brown glue for that glue up, for an extended glue up. And in this case, I'm gonna use the old brown. Now, it works better if it's a little bit warm, so what I'm doing is I'm just sticking it in my back pocket for a good 30, 40 minutes before I'm ready to glue up while I'm dismantling and get everything ready. And that just brings the temperature up a little bit. It makes it a little bit more viscous, a little bit less viscous, and easier to work with. So recommendation, you can also heat it up in you know lukewarm water, a little warm water, or uh, in a microwave, I believe. So. That's what I'm gonna do, that's the attack approach. I'm gonna start with this center bay. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna butter up the bottom of the two vertical dividers that create the center bay. I'm going to put those in place and then I'm going to put my center divider on the bottom in place. I'm gonna glue up the tongue and the dominoes that go into each of the shelves and I'm going to clamp the thing closed 
and I will place in the top divider, but not glue it just yet. After giving that ample time to dry, I am going to move to phase two, which is gluing up one end of the cabinet. And I'm going to follow the same procedure. I'm going to use 90 degree clamping guides. I'm going to start from the bottom and work my way up, gluing and clamping the bottom divider in place and getting horizontal clamping pressure on those shelves as quickly as possible. But in phase two, it is different because I'm going to glue in the top two dividers, both in the center and end bay, and I'm going to glue the top on in place. And once I give that time to cure, then it's time to move on to phase three, which is finalizing the glue up on this. I'm going to follow the same procedure, bottom to top, 90 degree guides, all of the things, but it's gonna be a little bit trickier given that I've already glued the top in. Not impossible, just a little trickier. So that is what we're gonna do. And then as a bonus, time to glue in the little pegs on the end grain, make sure they all look good, they feel good. And then after some period of time, once everything is nicely cured, I can take all of the clamps off and check for imperfections. And if all is good and right and well with the world, we should be in good shape to just do some minor touch-ups and get ready for finishing. got the cabin up to New York last night and unloaded it into the house and everything is looking good. No injuries during transit, which is always important. So today is install day and uh, we need to start getting busy. Is that right, Bob? All right, so here's how this assembly is gonna work. This is the plinth that the case actually sits on. It is going to get attached to the floor. It just needs to be leveled out. And so I can already tell you, listen, I grew up in this house. I know this house well enough. I know that this floor slants this way ever so slightly. So I need to shim this side up and detach the plinth to the floor. I've already got it marked out where it's going to sit. And then the cabinet is gonna get placed on top of this and get screwed to the plinth as well as to the wall over here. So this end is gonna be buttered up against the wall and screwed. And that end is gonna be floating, acting as the half wall, the divider between the living room and the stairwell. That's where we're at, that's what needs to happen. So, I'm gonna to get to level in a plinth. All right, the plinth is installed and it is level in both dimensions, meaning that when I place the cabinet on top, the cabinet should be plumb. Now, the cabinet's gonna get attached to the plinth and to the joists under the floor using something called a fast cap. They are essentially a wide head screw and these flat tops are gonna sit just below the surface by the thickness of these stickers. All these are, are sticker backed veneers, right? So they're real wood, they're white oak and these are going to sit on top of the screw head flush with the cabinet surface, making these essentially invisible. Let's get this thing placed on top, we'll get our alignments done, we'll screw the thing to the floor, and Lord willing the creek don't rise. That should be about it. I know I just jinxed, I know I just jinxed it, let's just do it anyway.
Now I do want to take a moment to thank Festool for partnering with me on this build. I could not have done this build without their support. They've been a wonderful supporter of my channel for a while now, and obviously they make fantastic tools. Everything from the domino that I used for the joinery on this piece to the 90 degree angle attachments on their drill that made the install super easy in tight spots like over there in that corner. So. Thanks to Festool, and if you guys want to check out any of the equipment that I used in this project, you can check the links below in the description. So, that's that. That's the install. It went literally as smooth as I could possibly have hoped it to go. Everything seated nice and properly on the floor. There were no issues finding joists. Getting it level and plumb and attaching it to the floor went beautifully. It was stable as a rock before I even attached it to the wall. So those two wall anchor points are only adding to the strength. So friends, I'm gonna call this one a project. So I hope this was helpful. I hope it was interesting and educational. I hope you can take some of the principles that you learned in this piece and apply it in future projects. Because even though it's aesthetically fairly straightforward, there's actually a lot going on here. Everything from the joinery to the layout of the book matches to the install. So I hope there was something in there for you. And I hope you go get in the shop and go make a thing. And until next week, friends. Cheers. You're going to have to articulate a little bit more than that, Rita. Oh my gosh. Little, little underwhelming reaction. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. There you oh, go. you fixed this. Oh, wow. There's a whole new piece of furniture in here. You notice the hole in the wall that I patched. I just said it's absolutely beautiful. Wow. I'm so excited I'm walking on the floor with shoes on. Oh, Rita. Oh, man.